and welcome to Art Salon. I'm Ellie Shore, for the few people that don't know me, and I've been facilitating these art salons for about five and a half years now. And I'm about to open the second biennial Artists of Art Salon exhibition, which is installed in Montgomery Hall and is everyone who has spoken at Art Salon in the past two years. There was another one that had 57 artists that was everyone had spoken in the three years before that. So it's been an incredible journey. I really look throughout South Florida for exciting artists who have something different and unique to add to the dialogue about contemporary art. And I think that there's an incredible wealth of talent here in South Florida. I've made it my own personal mission to try to find people in various corners and bring them together and create through the art salons my version of an art dialogue that is ongoing. And now it is my privilege to introduce Nazare Feliciano. Nazare is a professor of art and ceramics at Palm Beach State College, easy campus up in Palm Beach Gardens. And is someone who has combined her educational career and her art career and the, the wonderful dialogue that goes back and forth between them so that she becomes a very influential person to her students and to the art department that she's a part of, as well as to all of us who, who get to view her art. Her educational background is pretty complex. She's got four different degrees from actually three universities, but back and forth. Nazare earned a BA at Marymount Manhattan College in New York City and a BFA here at Florida Atlantic University, and then went up to Chicago for her MA in Interdisciplinary Fine Arts Studies from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and came back here to Florida, and in 2014, completed her PhD in Comparative Studies of Fine and Performing Arts. Her dissertation was Dance Bodily Knowledge Transferred to Sculpture and it focused on the sculptural artwork of Mary Frank. And Mary Frank was an American artist who conveys a unique sense of movement in her sculptures. She's still living. She's still living. Yes, she's going to be 83 next February. Nazare's talk is the sum of the parts. And as you can see in her installation in the exhibit in Montgomery Hall, she uses her terracotta and her porcelain pieces in very interesting, complicated ways to make larger pieces. And so she'll be telling us all about that. Thank you, Nazare. Thank you. Thank you, Elle. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Elle, for having these salons. I think it's, it's so great that uh, they are keeping the history of South Florida artists alive for posterity. I want to start with this presentation of my work, but I also want to give you a little bit of background of myself. I was born in Portugal in a very small town, a village, about 30 miles northwest of Lisbon, and from a very large family, so I visit every year. I go back every year. I moved to the United States when I was 19 years of age. I lived in New York for 13 years, and then I moved to Florida. When I came to the United States, I was planning to go back to Portugal <coughs> and probably work in a department of the European Common Market because I had languages, abilities, I had Portuguese, I had French, and then now, after being in New York and doing my bachelor's in New York, I had English. My first major was not in the arts. It was in international relations. I did an internship at the UN while I was at Marymount Manhattan College. And it was on my last year of studies that I encountered ceramics and the arts. Those were my electives. And I fell passionate in love and working with clay. So that was actually the beginning of my art and my art world. But I had finished my bachelor's, so I was kind of stuck. You know, where do I go from here now? So for six years, I worked in the fashion industry in New York City 
actually not fashion design for wear, but interior design. I worked with uh, Fortuny and Company. I don't know if any of you know the material. Um, it was designed for upholstery and draperies from this designer who lived in Geodeca, the island of Geodeca in Venice. So all the materials were imported to New York and I was part of that small group of people that sold the, the material to uh, decorators in the United States. So I was kind of in the art for the next six years, with, surrounded by beautiful art and furniture and um, fabric. But it was only when I moved to Florida that I had the opportunity to continue my bachelor's in fine arts. And so I did my BFA then at FAU in ceramics, and then went on to do my Master's of Fine Arts at the Art Institute of Chicago. And that uh, Chicago Art Institute totally opened a new world for me because it was the first time in my life that I was able to spend 24 hours just on my art. They gave me a scholarship where I had a studio 24 hours a day. So those three years were just one of the best times of my life. So my art actually started in New York, but more in a professional manner actually started in Florida. And then the Art Institute and then back to Florida. So one of my first pieces since I was working with clay, I just was dreaming about w working with clay and what would I would create with the clay material. So this is, um, I call it Desert City. It's a 36 by 36 piece, and it was kind of emulating the anthropological type of cityscapes that you would see probably from um, early man times. Not Egyptian, more into a South American type of a pyramid. So these are two separate pieces, molds, and then I set them on sand. This is another view of the same, the same piece. This is actually in a, been published in a book of tile work by Deborah Gollitz in um, New York City. Then going to Chicago, I created these very large pieces which I call sanctuaries. And they are six and a half feet by four and a half feet. I always wanted to challenge myself and challenge also the clay medium. And so for this piece, I had to create a very large mold where then I applied slabs of clay. And um, in Chicago, we had very large kilns, you know, we call them car kilns, where we actually could fire very large pieces like this. So this piece is really, uh, it's a sanctuary. I come from a religious background, uh, going to churches and cathedrals, and we always see, or oh, I always saw, uh, these shapes behind a saint or the Virgin Mary on a, on a church or a cathedral. So this idea was actually to bring that sainthood or that spirituality to the ground. So they are not standing on a vertical, they are actually placed on the ground. And then um, because of the largest of the piece, the natural crackering occur and I fill them with gold leaf. That's another view of the, that piece. This is the other one that I made with terracotta and then smoke fired. And the material that you see here, it's actually pieces of Fortuny fabric that then I created. It, I needed six people to carry these pieces. So I created these kind of pole bearers with three hanging pieces on each side. So six people would carry the piece. Conceptual art, this is also from my Chicago days. And it was something that I always felt of living in New York and living in the United States. Bread as a commodity 
was so foreign for me because my mother always baked bread every week, you know, coming out of a brick oven. And uh, we couldn't wait to have that warm bread. So when I came to the United States and saw the bread slice and in form, and it was just so foreign, so alien, that I kind of developed this piece to state that, you know, the end of sharing bread the way it was supposed to be, I guess, and the new way of, you know, people living with just making a sandwich its own ago and, and really not taking the time to create something more in the family space. That's why I have this contrast between the Wonder Bread and the Brick Oven Bread. It was really interesting. At the time, a friend of mine, actually an artist, he had the studio next to me, and he grew up on Wonder Bread. And so he, the feeling that he had for Wonder Bread was like the feeling that I had for the homemade bread. <laughs> so he is. He actually we ended up having a show together where he did drawings of slices of Wonder Bread with like a nativity scene or religious scene because that's what it meant for him. He just shares having that sandwich made with sliced bread. So it was really interesting that a totally different perspective that I had on the commodity bread. And this is a close up of the bread. Then moving on to another set of, of pieces. These pieces actually started in Chicago. I always wanted to challenge myself and challenge the medium as well. And clay and tiles are usually seen as very static and cold medium. And I wanted to make it warm and malleable, moving. And at the same time, I wanted to also challenge the belief that clay is not a primitive medium, but a contemporary medium. And so these pieces were developed from that concept. And so I bring contemporary material into it, the metal, the needles, the needles that I have all the way around this piece bring it into more a uh, household, home environment. And the porcelain weaved with the metal makes it malleable. I grew up with tiles on the walls. Every room in the house, probably the kitchen, the corridors, all had tiles with painted tiles. And so those were warm environments for me. In here, I make those tiles kind of move. These are small, hollow pieces that I created on molds. And so it's poured, slit porcelain. And on this piece, which is the largest quilt that I made of porcelain, it's a bad spread. And this is actually a shot from the show on the um, show tell, which Kata is here, she developed that event. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's actually in the, one of the rooms at the Hotel Viva. And on, on this piece, I have a very large drawing of a woman laying on the bed. And actually, she's inside of a pumpkin. We, we don't see it very well on this image, I think, the pumpkin. But that's why I have everything colored uh, orange, pumpkin-like. This is a close-up of that bedspread. And there's another image. Uh, so this is, shows a little bit more of the room. And then on the crib, I actually have a small baby blanket, which that baby blanket, it's in the show over here, displayed in a totally different way. And, and this piece comes from that rhyme that uh, Peter Peter, pumpkin eater, and so telling stories to children. And I, I started to uh, look and really see and observe the meaning of the words. And it was just very frightening to me that we are singing these 
songs to children. <laughs> and so that, that was kind of a development of this piece. And uh, this is the bathroom in the bedroom. Continue with the pumpkin theme. Here's another shot. And this was such a large piece that I decided to bring a little bit of the process because the drawings were all done by me, the layering by me, but everything had to be done on decals. So this is a long process. First I had to make the cubes, then I had to fire the clay with the porcelain, and then I had to do the drawing and then apply the drawing to the clay on decals. And that's why when you look at the color of the piece, it's this iron oxide. So that powder that prints the decal has iron oxide. And when it's placed on the porcelain that's already been fired with the glaze, it gets embedded with the heat, it gets embedded into the piece. And so I had to cut everything eight by 11 to fit in the printer and then after I had the printing, I had to cut everything an inch and a half by an inch and a half and make sure that everything fired properly. So I'm not making these anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can see how, how many pieces I had to do to get a um, bedspread. Here's a little close up of the pieces. So before I made the bedspread, I actually made some smaller quilts. One of them is this one, which is the immigrant ballad. So on these, as quilt, uh, and why I call them quilt, you know, the American quilt and the Portuguese tile. So I'm mixing these because right now I'm from here and I'm from Portugal. I am both, and, and this is in a way, these pieces represent this combination of these two cultures. And so on this one, I have the immigrant ballad. And it comes from um, a ballad from uh, the Mexican people who live in Chicago. And it, it goes, it says, um, Yo no quiero ir para Mexico, no más, no más. I have a policeman at my door. I give him a dollar, I don't want to go to Mexico, mas and mas. And so I did add the rhyme onto this quilt, but again, I have that home spawn imagery of the needles, the sewing, and something that you would sing when the family is together probably in the evening. And I think that one probably was the close up of the immigrant ballad, which is also present in the show. I have shown these pieces just hanging on a wall straight and you can read it, but I always wanted to show the malleability of the pieces and so I like this type of display much more. Here's another. This is baby blanket. And so on this, on this piece, I actually have the rhyme, the Peter Peter pumpkin eater. There it goes again. And so I have little bears and the little rattle, and then I have the rhyme, which everything looks so sweet, but when you read the rhyme, it's really not sweet at all. You know, so that contradiction. These I call the temple, and it's actually also in the show. This was an earlier work, and I felt I wanted to involve the public with the piece. So these are on magnets. So this is like an abstract landscape, but you could change the landscape by moving the pieces. 
So this one is actually present here. This piece, and I believe these two pieces, which are also quilts, were not supposed to look like this, smoke fired, but I had a show in November at the, the college in the gallery, and we had a hurricane, I think it was Wilma and the other one, and we didn't have electric for two weeks, and I had to finish these two pieces. So I just smoke fire them in my backyard <laughs> because there was no electric, and so I could not do any storytelling. So I really played around with the metal, and so you see some of the details. I really play it I, uh, around with the design as I fire and refire the pieces, and then I quilted them. So these two, I actually show them hanging. I like them as uh, hanging pieces. And this one, I call it the moon quilt and the earth quilt. They both terracotta. One is a lighter peach, the other one uh, more iron oxide content. And so uh, these pieces also came out of the same firing, the pit fire. It was my barbecue and the pit fire. And then I did barbecue some chicken on the side because my neighbors were concerned we were having a fire. <laughs> so. Because I just kept going for three days, I was just firing pieces. <laughs> this is in a show, which I, I don't know if this is, I think it's down in Lake Worth at the Cultural Center. I don't recall anymore, it's years ago. These are braids, but I call them either the Virgin Mary or Love and Care. This is about braiding hair, and these pieces are also a magnet. So the idea is that, yes, if you're not braiding the hair, you know, real hair, you actually could play around in here and do the braid. So the last time I showed them at the cultural center, I think maybe a year ago, yeah. And this one is a little bit more political, also using the same blocks of porcelain. This installation was done during the time of the Bush administration, and I called it Lies. And so I created this table where you fill in the words for all the different definitions you can use for lies. These days is, uh, what is it, alternative news? Uh, So after I finished with this series of kind of expanding on these cube-like porcelain pieces, I began my PhD at FAU, and that took me seven years. So I teach full time, and then I was doing my PhD. And so I was not doing really um, artwork for a while. But I did manage to invite friends to my house and I would do a dinner and then I'd ask everyone to do little flowers. And I created these um, pieces. I call them um, spring showers. So they just little flowers coming out of the clouds, a totally different work than previously. And then this is the other pieces that I've been working in with are ladles. And I like to display them as groupings. And these pieces, again, were done during the time that I was doing my PhD. So it was about censoring the body, since my PhD was about knowledge within the body, so dense knowledge within the body, and sensing the body, being aware of the body. And so these pieces come also from that being aware of the body and you know my own body and how these pieces were that's how they were developed is another view of it i have this idea that i wanted to do more of these and uh, present them in a show calling them uh, 
the land of milk and honey. <laughs> but I wanted to have bees actually do some work on them after I finished them, have some of them with some part of beehive or bee honey. And so even this piece is not completed yet. These are them individually, so they can be quite sexual in content. And then this one. So I feel this last four pieces that I've been creating, it's like I feel my work is in transition. I just create things that, OK, this is what I want to do now. It's not really a concept of a series. So these and uh, the showers and this one as well, which is still life with poppies. I really enjoy doing these. I have a series of three uh, sets of these now. And, and what I'm doing is I'm looking at paintings from the Impressionistic time of still lifes. And I see myself doing a still life, but in clay. And that's what these pieces refer to. And this one is actually in the show as well, so you can see it live. They are poppies, and poppies are quite controversial because of the opium that's going on now in the United States. But um, I remember having poppies, these we call them Indian poppies, in the gardens in, in Portugal, in my village. We didn't see anything wrong with those poppies. They were beautiful flowers. But one day, the troopers came through the village and they took everything. We, we just, we, I was a kid, I was seven years old. I didn't understand what was going on. Why were they so mad at the flowers? So I do have this recollection of you know, making something so that I find beautiful, but it also has this uh, dark side to it. So th that's why I, I get mesmerized by this duality of these pieces. So I consider these transitional pieces. For example, I, I just found this piece the other day in the thrift shop. And first I thought, oh, it's such an interesting shape. I want to have it. What is it? First I thought it was a cork or top of a bottle. And then I realized it's actually a handle for a drawer. But I have this idea of start a project, start a piece that starts from here, from this. That's my next challenge finding something and then find a piece that continues and completes this piece. So that's what I'm having now. I, I enjoy working with clay. I like the challenge. But there is so much stuff out there that I feel like I wanted to pick up something that's already made and then grow from that piece and build something else. So that's what I'm at right now. Still still in transition. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>